to worship together. Please stand. When the world works to divide us by color, creed, and status, come, come Holy Spirit, Spirit make us one. one. When the world calls us orphans, come, come Holy Spirit, Spirit, make us family. When the world leads us astray, come, come Holy Spirit, Spirit, call us home. Come Holy Spirit, come, come and fill this place. Please be seated. This morning, uh, Pastor Rick is on vacation with his family, and we want to remember him in our prayer. So let us now go to the Lord in prayer to start this day of worship. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Lord, we praise you in your sanctuary. Lord, we praise you in the mighty heaven. We praise you for your power and your greatness. Lord, we praise you with music and singing. And Lord, we praise you for our very breath. Lord, we ask that today as we come here to worship you, that you fill us with your spirit to guide us and to move us. Lord, to remember our purpose. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Rick and his family, for Karen and Jacob. Please give them rest and renewal. Give them health and peace and bring them back to us safely. Lord, we worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you in worship today. And I just want to remind you that many of you have asked this week about Eileen and her husband, Ben. Ben is still in the hospital. Ben's going to have to have more surgery this week. And so we hope that you will keep Ben and Eileen Winkle in your prayers. Eileen has had COVID and is still not feeling uh, well. And so we're just praying for both of them this week as they deal with a a very difficult time, so I hope that you will remember them throughout this next week. Our opening hymn this morning is number 577, God of grace and God of glory, pour your people on your power. Will you stand? <laughs> Courage, sir. 
with our affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Sunday of the month. There's no written law about that. We can have communion anytime we want to. Next Sunday, we're going to do Patriotic Sunday. The music will be the message. We're going to have uh, instrumentalists here, special soloists here. The choir is prepared to do some great music to celebrate our faith and our freedom to, to celebrate our faith as we please. And that will be the service next Sunday at 8.30 and at 11 o'clock. And then we're going to do communion the following Sunday. Uh, on uh, July the 10th. So we hope that you'll be here for both of those times. And I would just say, and I'm sure Jeff would say the same thing, whether if, if you have uh, children in your life, your children, your grandchildren, or children you know, we don't care if they're church members, we don't care who they are. We want children to come, both for worship and arts camp and Bible school. So we hope that you will encourage that, and you can do all that online. Thank you, ma'am. Please stand and greet one another. to the screen, you'll see the, a video from last week. Our youth went on a mission trip here in town, and you'll see some of the things they did.
He wanted to try something different this year, so he did that, and I think he knocked it out of the park. Uh, we have next Sunday an important event at uh, 1 o'clock. It is the 8th Annual Ping Pong Tournament, Sweet Freedom Ping Pong Tournament. If you remember, though, for the past seven years, it was titled a little differently. Uh, for the past couple of years, the second one was called the second first annual. The third one was called third first annual. I kept doing that because I never won, and we were not going to call it something unless I won it. Well, last year I finally won. Thank you. No thanks. And uh, so this year it's the eighth annual. Ten dollars to enter. All the proceeds go to the Brazos Church Pantry. I'd like to invite all the children forward for their special time. This morning, what I'm going to do, how many, have you seen Wheel of Fortune? This is going to be kind of like Wheel of Fortune and uh, a word jumble. I'm going to put out some letters here, and I want you to try to figure out what name it spells out. You got any clues so far? Holla. I don't know. What do you think? Remember, it's a name. What about now? Anything? What can? What name do you think you could make out of that so far? How about Sarah? I see Sarah. You think you can make Sarah? Let's see what. Uh, it's not Sarah. Whoa! <laughs> Brett's like, wait a minute. What? What do we got here? Remember, this is one name. Another A. What's that? No? That's good. Get, man, another A? Is A the only vowel in this name? Here, scoot back a little bit, Casey. Guess what? Another A. What do you think? You got anything yet? Throw another H in there. And just for fun, let's throw another H in there. Oh, and looky there, an E, another vowel. This is one name. There's, a, there's an actor who has a, a name that's in this, but it's a shortened part of the name. This is 18 letters. Do y'all still use Scantrons in school? Imagine how long it would take to bubble in your name if it was this long. Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to redo this a little bit, and hopefully I can remember it. M. This name is in the Bible, by the way. It's the longest name in the Bible. Hand me that E. Bring that E over here, Casey. Put it right there. Okay. Got it yet? It's weird, huh? Yeah. All right. All right, now we need... Put that A in there again. You know what? I could have messed up. Now an L. We need another L right there, Casey. Now an H. Now another A. Now an S. Now an H. No, wait. Yeah, an H. <laughs> now a B. Now an A. And guess what? A Z. Look at this name. Now, if I mispronounce it, don't call me on it, okay? Mayor Shalal Hashbaz. So, what is this name? This person was the son of Isaiah the prophet, and he named his son this. Isn't that nice? And his name has a meaning. It has a purpose. Now, if you had this name, wouldn't you hope that it has a meaning and a purpose? that you carry this tag around with you all the time. Imagine your name tag on your shirt or something, or if, like, this was on the back of your baseball uniform, 
It'd be one of those that like rainbows almost. But so you think, oh, well, great, my name has a purpose, a meaning. What does this mean? It means quickly to the plunder. Oh, man, hey, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, what does your name mean? It means quickly to the plunder. He was named after two places that were essentially going to get looted, to get plundered. Now, if I had this long handle right here, and that was the purpose of my name, I think I would be a little bit sad. But people in the Bible, their names always had some kind of meaning for God's purpose. Moses meant he drew, he, he, he drew out of water, means he was picked up out of the water when his mother put him in the river. Okay, we have Jesus, which means to save all his people. So your name has a purpose, but the name that has that purpose may not be Brett or Casey. It may be whatever name God has given you, which is your purpose. So we may not know that name, but we know God calls us by it because he has a purpose for you. Now, you should go home and thank God that you didn't get this name because you would have a long time. Again, filling out scantons is what I remember all the time as a kid. But I want you to know, until you find out what God's purpose is for you, your number one purpose is to praise him, to worship him in everything that you do, whether it's playing baseball or doing music or doing chores for your parents. Your purpose is to worship God in everything that you do. So why am I cleaning the bathrooms and scrubbing the toilets? I'm doing it to honor God because he told me to honor my father and mother. So know that you have a purpose. Know that God calls you by your name. And he's got that purpose for you. My verse comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, and it says, But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you for calling us by our name. And thank you for claiming us as yours. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You just know they had to call him Baz for short. They surely didn't use that name all the time. You'd know your mother was mad at you if she called you a name that long, for sure. Um, this morning we're going to sing a medley of hymns that are all about our unity as Christian people, our unity in Christ. The first one is one that's a newer text to the tune of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, which I know you know well. Christian people sing together, and then we're going to sing We Are One in the Bond of Love, and then finally, from the hymnal, How Can We Name a Love? Will you stand together as we sing? <laughs>
the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we reflect on these, these hymns that we just sang to you. These songs remind us that we are united together through Christ. We thank you for our many blessings. And we pray for those who are less fortunate than we are. And we pray those for those that are hurting, who are grieving, and in many different seasons of their life. We pray that they will feel your power and your love. Today we continue in worship, glorifying you through our tithes and offerings. May they be used to grow your kingdom. We pray all these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not as thou hast been. Thou forever wilt be. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in the courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy Morning by morning, no mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. I 
reading, which will be in page 9 of your pew Bibles, is Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinoa and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, there are one people and they have all but one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse the language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Daniel. I want to thank Pastor Rick for the opportunity to preach this morning. It's an honor to be in the pulpit to share with you this morning, and I want to thank Daniel for reading. It's always a joy to have our young people take a part in the service, and he is always so willing to do it. Now let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to want you to open them to Genesis, to Ecclesiastes, to the book of Haggai. If you don't have your Bible, grab a few Bible. And then Matthew. Bookmark those books. Genesis, Ecclesiastes, Haggai, and Matthew. Because we're going to go on a journey today through those books. So buckle up. This next week... I will be preaching at Lakeview in the elementary camp, and the theme is, Hello, My Name Is, and it focuses on names, their meanings, and being called by God by your name. So when Pastor Rick asked me to preach, I said I would go along with that theme since I'll be preaching on it this next week. 
But for a while now, I've also wanted to do a sermon on technology and faith. And I believe that the story of the Tower of Babel accomplishes both of these things. So last night, Daniel texted me and he said, are you going to be talking about Nimrod? And it was so weird because I was like, did he find my sermon somewhere? Because, yes, I actually am talking about Nimrod. And uh, so I just thought, wow, either, well, I was going to say either he knows a lot more about the Tower of Babel than I do, which is true. He probably does. Uh or he read my sermon, because I want to start with the name Nimrod. How many of you would like to be called Nimrod? Raise your hand. One hand, all right. (laughs) Well, how many of you have ever been called Nimrod? Anybody? Yeah, well, it's not the nicest name to be called, is it? Well, Nimrod, who was the great-grandson of Noah, His name means a mighty warrior, a mighty hunter. So how does a mighty warrior, a mighty hunter, become an insult after all of these years? Do you know why it is an insult now? Bugs Bunny. That's why it's an insult. Bugs Bunny, sarcastically called Elmer Fudd, Nimrod... Because what was Elmer Fudd? A hunter. What did he hunt? Wabbits, that's right. So Bugs Bunny sarcastically called him, oh, great Nimrod. But so many people didn't understand the biblical reference and just thought it was an insulting name. So that's where we get the name Nimrod for when you do something that's not very smart. But it's because of Bugs Bunny that it changed from a great meaning to a not-so-great meaning. Now, Nimrod was a ruler. He ruled uh, a a few places that we're going to talk about today, but one of those was the land of Shinar. And we need to remember that after Noah and his family got off the ark, they were given a command by God God commanded them to be fruitful and multiply on all the earth and to increase upon it. In other words, to spread out on God's creation, to scatter. Well, they get to the plain of Shinar, and they decide, all right, this is our place. We're going to settle here. We're not going to spread out anymore on God's creation. It's kind of denying God's command and what he was wanting them to do. And so instead of spreading out, they decide to move up. They built themselves up to make a name for themselves, as it says in Genesis 11. They felt they didn't need God to reach the heavens, not heaven, but the heavens, the sky. They would get up there all on their own. So this tower became a symbol of the self-focused life, the self-centered life, the life that doesn't need God to accomplish something. But God responded, says, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Babel. Let's make a name for ourselves. Do we see this trend today anywhere? The need to make a name for ourselves? 
self-focused life. I think if you don't see the tower being built today, you're blind. Our tower is technology. It's social media. We use technology and social media to build ourselves up build ourselves up to the heavens and to make a name for ourselves. There's nothing we can't do today when we have our phones. It's actually kind of ridiculous to still call this device a phone because what we do on it is so little, talking to people, an actual voice conversation is probably only a small percentage of what people use a phone for today. But it is the tower of our lives. I think it's kind of funny. I just got a notification that my screen time was up 15% last week. Thank you. But we build ourselves up on social media, posting the best parts of our lives. And then there are those who build themselves up on social media by tearing others down. Phones and technology allow us to get away from our problems. We can binge watch TV shows endlessly. We can get on the next door app and complain about our HOA, even though our HOA presidents do a great job, don't they, Nick? You can go online and find an opinion about anything. And then you can find an opinion about the other side of that thing, and then you will find people arguing about those opinions. Have you seen any of that happening this week? But you also have people that show their anger on social media, and they believe it to be righteous anger. Well, anger is not righteous. Living a holy life is what makes you righteous. Your response to anger could be righteous, but your anger is not what makes you righteous. And there are those that you, when you get on Facebook or Twitter, you may just want to get on there, and maybe that's where you get your weather or your news, because that is part of the purpose of these apps for you to be connected so you know all there is to know about your world, the news, the weather, whatever. But then you may get on there, and you may be stuck on there forever just looking at stuff. And then you may see something that's negative, and after you get off, I went on to check the weather. But now I've seen so many people arguing that I'm depressed after I see it. The negativity on social media is it not Babel? The meaning of Babel is a confused noise by a number of voices. Social media is Babel. This technology wasn't created for this purpose, but it has evolved into this. Why has it done this? Because we are sinful beings. We take something created for one purpose, and then we try to make a name for ourselves, make it our own, and this is what happens. Instead of sharing love, we share hate, we share negativity, but we also waste our time. Scrolling through people's lives and the junk they post, then you find you've been on it way too long. Now, this is something that surprised me the past couple of years as we've given our daughters, we've let, given them iPads, and we let them watch YouTube Kids. Now, we don't let them watch just anything. We let them follow certain YouTube channels. But the one thing that they like to watch more than anything is children opening packages of toys and then the children play with the toys on the video. And I ask my daughters, why don't you just go play with toys instead of watching somebody else play with toys? What a waste of time. 
And then there are adults that do that. They unpackage the toys and play with them. And let me tell you, these people are making money off the views they get on YouTube. Somebody is making money for unpackaging toys and play with, playing with them. You've worked too hard in your life, people. Technology. We could use it to do good things, but we use it to fight, to pass time, to hear the viewpoint we want to hear, and to make a name for ourselves. My first semester in college, I took a philosophy class, and uh, I regretted it just about the first week I was in there. It was, the name of the class was Technology and Human Values. So we talked about the moral challenges of the time, which was 1997. And do you know what the biggest moral debate was at that time? Who remembers this? What is this sheep's name? Dolly, that's right. It is the first cloned sheep. Why are we cloning sheep? You know, at the time we thought, in 20 years, we'll be cloning humans. And we were talking about the moral debate of that. Why do we need to clone humans? Is your drive home not packed enough as it is? But to me, it wasn't about the need for more sheep. But it was about the need to look what we can do. Look at this. Look what I am able to do to make a name for ourselves. Now, I'm not a Luddite, but technology and to the need to make a name for ourselves has taken our focus away from the kingdom of God. We have this need to be someone. How many of you have ever driven underneath this bridge on I-45 in Houston? Have you seen this before? Now, if you go online, I'm telling you to go online in a sermon about don't go online. But if you go online and look up this overpass with the be someone graffiti on it, you will see a movement to keep the graffiti on it. Because many times it has been painted over with other graffiti. And you know what? People get mad. How dare you graffiti over the graffiti with the awesome message to be someone. We get so mad about something so ridiculous. Oh, be someone. What does that mean? Every time I drive under that, I think of Forrest Gump saying, well, aren't I going to be me? Be someone. Why do we have this need? Why is it so hard for us to follow Paul's advice in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12, when he says, to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may respect, win the respect of outsiders. How do you think that would go if you posted that on Facebook? Lead a quiet life, mind your own business. But we instead have a need to find acceptance in Babel through social media instead of finding acceptance in the kingdom of God through a Savior that loves you, Jesus Christ. So God scattered the people and confused the language because he did not like where they were going. The tower went unfinished. How embarrassing that must have been to spend all that time working on it just to have it go unfinished, for people to see it unfinished. Every time they walk by, look, the people that tried to make a name for themselves, they couldn't finish their tower. You know, it's almost like being or telling everyone you're the greatest ping pong player in the world and then not winning a tournament that you started. Unfinished. 
when you rely on your own skills, your own needs, your own wants, and you can't take it with you. Think about all the things we do here on earth, or as it says in Ecclesiastes, under the sun. These are the things that are apart from God, the things we do to build ourselves up, to give us meaning, to give us pleasure. Now we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and if you'll take a look at that with me. It says, The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What a great start to a book of the Bible. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams fall, flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye is, never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is full of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was already here. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study, to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. It may sound tough to hear that what you do on earth is meaningless, but remember that this is the stuff that you do that is not of God. Maybe you build a business. You make a good name, but once you're gone, then what? What happens to that business? Maybe it's sold. Maybe it's squandered. Your tower is unfinished. Maybe you save up wealth to give on to the new generations. You have no control what happens to it after you're gone. Everything that we do under the sun without God is meaningless. It comes and it goes. But yet we give so much of what is precious to us, our time and our energy, to this stuff, this tower that will just ultimately go unfinished. So what gives us meaning? The kingdom of God. A kingdom that you have because of Jesus Christ. A kingdom that you have when you are baptized, you join God's team, you put on his jersey, but you still have to decide are you going to play for the name on the front of the jersey or the name on the back? Have you ever been on a team, whether it be a sports team or a team for a school project, where someone didn't pull their weight? Maybe they missed practice for one reason or another or didn't do their part of the assignment, but they still show up for game day, don't they? Or to present the assignment in class. They're playing for the name on the back of the jersey and not the name on the front, God's kingdom. 
which name are we playing for? You know, last week, I appreciate all that was done for to celebrate the 20 years I have worked at this church, and I was given a baseball jersey with the name FUMC on the front and Hobbs on the back. And people told me that once, this, once you're gone, this church is going to be in trouble. Well, I hope not. I hope not. And I don't see it that way at all. Because once Hobbs is off the, off the back, the name on the front will continue. And I hope it continues to flourish without me. Maybe because of something I built. But if I leave, if I build something up and then it just crumbles after I leave, it would have been nothing. It would have been meaningless. It's all about the name on the front, and that is for God's kingdom. Now, many of you know that Haggai is one of my favorite books of the Bible, and I'm going to get through this soon. I've got about one page left. I love Haggai. If you'll turn to it, if you had it bookmarked, it's two chapters. It's one of the minor prophets. It takes place at the end of the Jews' exile, when they were given permission to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed, they laid the foundation of the temple. They were on fire for God. Yay, we're back. We're free from captivity. We're rebuilding what was once ours so we can worship God. But then they say, oh, but what about my house? I've got to build my house. I've got to stop working on God's house. I've got to have a place to live. So Haggai chapter 1 verse 2, it says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Was this written this year? We are chasing after these things that will not fill us because we are not putting the kingdom of God first. Skip down to verse 9. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you blew... What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. The people who were on fire for God when they left captivity, they fizzled out. How did they fizzle out? They put themselves first, their own homes. But then once the prophet Haggai told them about this, they responded. They went and finished the temple. The Lord stirred up their spirit, as it says in verse 13. Stirred up their spirit. Well, we have been freed from captivity. We were once slaves to sin, stuck in a separation from God because of our sin. And God, through his righteousness, sent his son Jesus to earth to show us the way. To show us the way to love and to live. He showed us how to reach not the heavens, but heaven through him, the way, the truth, and the life. And because of my sin and yours, a sacrifice was needed for atonement. And Jesus willingly gave up his life on the cross so that we may be saved from our sins. The name of Jesus, which means the Lord saves. But the good news doesn't stop there. Jesus had victory over death through the resurrection and gave us a new life through him. We will one day be resurrected because of the name of Jesus, not because of our name, not because of anything we have done here on this earth other than believe in his name. But it doesn't stop there. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, where he intercedes on our behalf, and it ends with him coming back. And we are waiting for that glorious day, the second coming of Christ, where he will judge the quick, the living, and the dead. 
We don't know when that day is coming, but we know it will come like a thief in the night. We know that we will be recognized by our fruit. And I'm not saying you will be saved by your good works, because you are not. I'm saying that building up the kingdom of God comes from your strong faith, the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, Jesus is going to be looking for people who are playing for the name on the front of God's jersey, not on the back. Matthew 6.33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Let us ask in everything that we do how it glorifies God, whether it be technology or work or our hobbies, our families. Be a player on a team that shows up for practice, that makes time every day for God's word. A player that puts God first in your schedule and in your budget. A player that lifts other teammates up when they are feeling weak. Making a name for ourselves is meaningless. Living for the name of Jesus is eternal. Ask God to stir up your spirit, the spirit of our church, the spirit of our nation, the spirit of our world, as we work to have his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. today with a spirit stirred up by the Lord. Let us go out and live in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our mission is to love, witness, and serve. Thank you.